Podcasting from a little cabin on a hill. This is the Stacy Westfall Podcast. Stacy's goal is simple, to teach you to understand why horses do what they do, as well as the action steps for creating clear, confident communication with your horses. Hi, I'm Stacy Westfall, and I'm here to teach you how to understand, enjoy, and successfully train your own horses. In this season of the podcast, I'm going to explain some of the choices in tack and equipment that are out there, as well as what I'm using and why I'm using it. Today, I'm focused on some of the items that we use when leading the horse, halters, lead ropes, lunge lines. And I'll introduce you to a friend of mine who owns a tack store. At the end, I'll close with a sad story and the biggest training tip that matches this discussion. Let's get started. Equipment is such a big subject that breaking it down is even a challenge. As always, if you have questions, please leave a voicemail on my website or send me an email at westfallhorsemanship at gmail.com. I've been in the industry for a long time, so sometimes the most obvious thing for me to explain, I forget to explain. I will not judge you for any question you might have. I know how it feels to be a little bit lost sometimes when you're dealing with something like tack. My recent deep dive into dressage was a great reminder of what it's like to be a beginner again and not know how something is supposed to fit. Plus, new tack items are always coming out. So even if you've been in the industry for a while, there's probably something new to learn. And that's one of the reasons I love having a friend who owns a tack store. Let's listen to my discussion with Trish Campis from the Stagecoach West. Her dad, Jack Peacock, started the store, and next year, in 2020, Stagecoach West will be 40 years old. Trish owns horses and rides, and I love learning about all the new things that are on the market from her. Let's listen to my discussion with Trish. So on today's show, Trish, I'd like to talk to you about halters and leads and lunge lines and basically what the options and materials are that someone might see if they walked into your tax store and they're kind of standing there just looking around trying to decide what to buy. Sure. Um, Most new horse people, when they walk in our store, you know, if they're looking for a halter, there's many different options. Uh, What we would try to do is ask them a little bit more information about their horse, uh, what kind of horse it is, do they have pictures, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then try to work our way through sizing because all the halters come in sizes. Mm-hmm. And then maybe find out if the horse is stalled or if it's going to be turned out or if it's a little bit of both. And then we would go through the different, you know, the different materials that halters are made out of, whether they're looking for a leather halter or a all nylon halter or a nylon halter with breakaway parts to them. Yeah. Now Um, the store's been running for 40 years. Have you seen like different trends as far as what halters are more popular? Like, does it kind of cycle around? It it does. Um, Recently it's the bright colors, you know, um, just a, a lot of breakaway safety issues on the halters. People are more aware of that now. Mm-hmm. More so than maybe, you know, trends before it was all leather, you know, and the price of leather has gone up mm-hmm. in comparison to with some of the nylon, you know, the better nylon halters. So, though, you know, it kind of sells both. Yep. More, more nylon now because I think the colors. Yeah. And That's then cool. you probably, so I'm going to guess because I'm trying to think about my own personal barn. I have some leather. I have some nylon flat, and then I also have some rope halters. So is that pretty much cover the whole gamut of halter options? Uh, Yeah, I would say those are your three top ones. And, you know, rope halters have gone in waves too. Uh, Recently, they've picked back up where I think more people are aware that they're a nice option um, when they're starting their horses. Mm -hmm. And then... I know we're covering several different segments now, but like lead ropes, what kind of materials and do you have in lead ropes and what, what, what's kind of on the shelf there? So lead ropes, we have a lot, uh, almost every color imaginable to match every color halter that's out on the market. <laughs> uh, they uh-huh. come in poly, polypropylene is probably your number one material. 
which is your typical five eighths inch rolled rope. Uh, they come with snaps. They come with chains. Uh, they have cotton. They have bamboo material now. Bamboo. Um, bamboo. I don't think I felt that yet. <laughs> what what would what would a it's, bamboo it's, lead rope feel like? It's it's soft. It's very soft. It's not anything. It always comes in a mint green color, and it's oh, it's, it's different. It has a little spring to it. Huh. Um, you know, and they come flat nylon leads and uh, leather leads. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of leads out there and they come in all different sizes. Mm -hmm. Typically they're nine feet, but then you can get eight feet and 12 feet, 15 feet, 25 feet, 20 feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then when you so, go to lunge, when you go to lunge lines versus a lead rope, is it the same material choices in lunge lines pretty much? Pretty much. Yes. Uh, we see more people uh, are staying away from the flatter, you know, like a, a web nylon, which is a yeah. little rougher. Because I find that people, you know, even personally, they have a tendency to, if you don't have gloves on, will rip through your hands. So I yeah. mean, more cotton, more of the softer poly leads or lunge lines would work better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that then... better. Yeah, I think that probably covers. I'm, 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 I'm imagining standing in the aisle way, and and you're right. I mean, there's the material and the way it feels in your hand, and then there is the colors, the the color. Yeah. Like, do I want color? Do I not want color? Do I want everything in the barn matching? Do I want individual colors for different horses? But the feel in my hand is probably my my first thing I want to know about, and then, yep, the colors. Yes, that's usually how it goes. <laughs> Is there anything else in that aisle way that would kind of pertain to halters, leads, lunge lines, and that kind of stuff that, that I might have missed? Oh, the only other thing that I could think of would be like fleece nose covers. I mean, they have for sometimes people when they're shipping their horses want to put the fleece over there. Okay. You know, like yeah. the, the different nylon halters are made out of different nylon. Some are web, some are polypropylene or like a premium nylon. Um, the other thing with halters, some are, you know, uh, adjustable, more adjustable, less adjustable. Good point, because you're right. I forgot. I, I personally have gotten to where I use more of the ones that are not quite as adjustable underneath the nose and stuff, which I think just the sizing of, I, I happen to be using the weaver halters and the sizing fits my horses really well when it's just mm -hmm. the standard one. So pretty much the only thing that moves is the over the over the pole kind of that crown piece is the only thing to buckle and unbuckle and I personally yeah. like the fit but now that you say that I totally remember that yeah you can get them where they have the crown piece unbuckles over the top you can have the snap on the side you can have the buckle for sizing underneath of the nose and you can get a lot of different adjustments going on that's right I forgot about yeah. that yeah you know, so very yeah, interesting the size you know, ranges too. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they come from, you know, you can get mini to pony to Arab to yearling horse to horse to large horse and then draft. So, I mean, so, there's a pretty yeah wide range of sizing. So is that, is that why you were saying if they bring in a pitcher, it's helpful? Oh, it, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. We've tried most of the halters in our store, you know, one way or, in the, or another, whether it's, you know, a company sends us samples, we go home and test them on our own horses and then mm -hmm. can kind of determine, okay, they're a medium fits this kind of horse or a small fits this kind of horse or mm -hmm. so usually yeah. when we see pictures, it's helpful. Yeah, I can see that because I walk in and, and people in clothing stores are really good at kind of looking at me and going like, I'll bet you this is the right size and nine times out of 10, they're correct. So I could see where you guys would have yes. developed that ability with the horses, with the photos. So oh, absolutely. that's, that's a great idea. I know that if you have more experience, like, like I do, I either like look at the actual sizing on something I already have, or because it's mm -hmm. my own horse, I can kind of hold something up. Or I know I've told a few people like, you know, if you have one you like, you could measure a few key pieces on that piece of equipment so you could go compare it to something in a store but yeah well thank you for sharing your knowledge you're very welcome so when i walk out into the barn odds are the first piece of tack i'm going to touch 
is going to be some version of a halter and a lead rope. And in my barn, I've got four different options. I've got something called a quick catch halter. I've got rope halters. I've got nylon halters. And I've got leather halters. So I'm just going to run down through what those different things would be used for, why I use them, the frequency of what I use, and just kind of some things for you to consider. So the thing I probably use the least often is the leather halter. And that's just because I tend to want to save my leather halters for the nice stuff, the photo shoots and when I'm going to shows and that kind of thing. Which is kind of interesting because they actually, as far as leather goes, they wear really well. So when they finally do get below the category of show, they will occasionally like show up in the barn and I'll use them a little bit there. But most of the time, my leather halters are kind of saved for special occasions. I personally really like the the look of leather because growing up, I associated leather halters with racehorses because those would be the horses I saw on TV whenever they had the Kentucky Derby. So I really associate leather with nice and fancy and all that stuff. And I love that it wears really well. So sometimes when I'm doing something like this, I think, why am I not using it more? But let's go on and talk about the other things that I am using and why. The next halter that I use probably, you know, a little bit more would be the nylon halters. And now when we look at the difference between the leather and the nylon, the similarities would be that they're both a flat fit on the horse's head. So they're kind of a wider, flat kind of a crown piece and nose band and and that kind of thing. And as far as the look goes, nylon is nice because you can pick different colors The material can be really soft. I've got some really nice ones from Weaver Leather, really soft and nice. So they've got a nice feel and they're going to function very similar to the leather in that they're going to kind of lay flat. One thing that both the leather and the nylon have for options, if you're standing there looking at them, that's kind of interesting is you can get them both that are very adjustable. So they're going to be adjustable over the crown piece, which is the part that goes over the horse's head behind the ears. That's going to be something that's going to be adjustable there. But you also have the option of having that be the only thing that's adjustable. So in my barn, my leather and nylon halters tend to only have the crown piece that you can buckle and unbuckle. Now, you could also have a leather or a nylon halter that has a snap near the throat latch and if you unsnapped the snap there, you could just slide the the crown piece over so you wouldn't necessarily have to unbuckle that. And you also could have a buckle down around that would adjust the size of the nose band. So there could be an adjustment down there. There could be the snap. And then there's always going to be that crown piece adjustment. So it might be interesting for you to know that on my nylon and my leather halters, I choose the ones that only have the crown piece. So mine don't have the snap on the side and don't have the adjustment at the bottom. And I know that sometimes if people haven't used those, they're like, how can that possibly work? But for me, the weaver leather sizing works really well on my horses. And I love how clean that that look is, that it doesn't have all those adjustments, that it doesn't have all the buckles. And that's just, again, we get into some personal preference there. Even there's personal preference on function and personal preference on feel and personal preference on look. I do like that I can do colors for the different horses. I do like that I can get matching lead ropes that match. And so I will also similarly kind of hold on to some of my nicer nylon sets for a while and kind of like use them for, you know, special occasions a little bit more, but I'm more likely to move that nylon halter into um, a a useful situation, more use, more daily use. And again, I'm going to talk about that whole flow of my workflow in a minute. The thing I use the most is a toss up between my rope halter or my quick catch halter, but you're going to see that they have distinctly different uses. So let me just talk about the rope halter for a minute. So with the rope halter, again, the only adjustment that you're going to have there is going to be that that crown piece. You're going to you're going to buckle it over 
the horse's pole. You're going to tie it on the side. It's going to have a different look because it's more narrow than your flat web nylon halter or your flat leather halter. And so there's a look that goes with it. Mine that I've designed have a colorful nose band, or I mean, you could get black with a tan, so there's less less of a bright, but they're going to have kind of a colorful nose band. And so there's a little bit of a thing to do with the look, but a lot of people will choose a rope halter because of the function. And when we talk about the function, if you want to compare the rope halter to the flat halters, which that would put the nylon or the leather into that same category. When you look at a flat, a halter that lays flat and kind of wide, that's going to distribute pressure across the horse a little bit more um, over, over a wider area. And so the rope halter is typically, and mine are all around, they're like a round rope that the halter is made with. And that also means that when you're using it for like a training halter or a leading halter, it's got a little bit more narrow pressure point that it would apply to the horse if the horse were to resist. And so one move that I've seen happen over the years is that years ago, when rope halters weren't really a thing, I noticed there were a lot more, looking back, there's a lot more people that were using chains. And now I see a serious rise in the number of rope halters that are used and a lot less chains that are being used. And so you'll still find lead ropes that have chains or lunge lines that have chains. But that's something that I think has changed over the years is that the rope halters add a little bit more of that of pressure, but obviously it doesn't have any of the other issues that chains would have, which we can talk about a little bit later at the end when I'm wrapping up some of the things I don't use and why. So the rope halter is something that I go to quite a bit because of the function and the feel. I kind of like how it, I can get the horse, I can get that nice and snug. I can get that on there nicely. I like the look personally, especially for a lot of my horses that kind of have more petite heads. I think that when they've got the the thin, narrow halter on, it can kind of look neat on them. And I'm really, really into the function. I use the rope halter for a lot of the training situations that I'm going to talk about in a minute. The quick catch halter is the halter that I use a lot also. And it is a bit of an unusual thing. If you haven't seen it, you might need to go to the website to take a look at it. It's something that if you want to take a look at it, if this explanation doesn't make sense, I'll make sure that there are links on the website so you can see it. But basically, the quick catch halter is not a training tool. It is just made with the function of leading the horse from point A to point B. But having said that, it is uh, maybe the most used halter in my barn. It's kind of a toss up between that and the rope halters that are laying around. But the quick catch halter comes in really handy for slipping it on the horse, leading a horse out to the paddock, going out to the paddock, bringing the horse back into the stall or moving a horse from one stall to another stall. It is not for tying. It is not for hauling. But when you have a horse that you move around a lot, it's super handy. So the way that it works is basically, if you can imagine, it is the crown piece that goes over behind the horse's ears and the nose piece that goes over the top of the horse's nose. That is the majority of the halter is that. And then the piece that goes underneath the horse's chin is actually part lead rope and part of the halter. So it runs through from the horse's offside to the the onside of the horse underneath the chin and turns into your lead rope. So basically, you can you can put the horse's nose through, slide it up over the horse's ears, and then you kind of slide that rope tighter so that it's that's what it sizes very quickly. And what I love about it is that. In my barn, I have horses that tend to either have small or average size heads. And if I'm going to be moving horses from stall to stall or in and out of the paddocks, that means that you've got to be able to carry a couple different size halters, but not so much so if you're using this quick catch halter, because all the horses in the barn 
can use the quick catch halter all the way from my the two year olds that are in here to my older horses, anywhere from these little ones that we have that are maybe 800 pounds to some of these ones that are like 1200 pounds. And they're the, like these bigger horses, 16 hand horse versus a 14 hand horse. And I'm able to use the same quick catch halter to move them around. And that's the convenience of it. So if I go back through when I walk out to the barn, it's a toss up and it, it literally just depends on what I'm going to use. But I'm either grabbing for the quick catch halter because I'm going to move a horse around and I want something quick and easy. Or I tend to have the rope halters that are hanging around. Those are my my top two go to halters. What I don't use the rope halter for is hauling horses. I personally like to haul the horse in. So if I'm going to be trailering them somewhere, I would prefer to use either the flat nylon or the flat leather. And that is just because by the time I'm trailering the horse, I'm no longer considering this to be as much of a training situation. A lot of times when I've got my rope halter on, it is common for my rope halter to have a little bit of room around the nose piece a little bit more. And so that's why I feel like there's a little bit more risk of being able to get something possibly caught in there. But since I'm predominantly using the rope halter as a training halter, that means I'm attached to the end of the rope and I'm interacting with the horse or if the horse is tied up when I've got it tied somewhere, I feel safe. I should also note here that I tend to haul my horses in the trailer not tied so their heads are able to drop down to the ground. If I'm tying the horse in the trailer, it doesn't bother me at all to have a rope halter. So that probably would actually clarify why I'm using that a little bit different. I want to cover more than just the halters here. I want to go ahead and and say that, you know, when I, if I'm not grabbing the quick catch halter, which is kind of an all-in-one unit, which is halter and lead rope combined. Again, look at the website and see how that looks, if that doesn't make any sense. But basically, if I'm grabbing a rope halter or a leather or a nylon, then I probably have a poly lead rope on it. I use poly, uh, you'll hear in my interview with Trish that there's all kinds of different options, but I like the poly because it doesn't pick up sawdust or hay or dirt when I drop it on the ground. Most of my halters are laying around with a lead rope attached. I kind of like either having the lead rope color match or I have a lot of black because then it's just kind of a neutral color. And most of my general lead ropes that I'm just going to move a horse from Say I'm going to bring it out from the stall and ground tie it and, while I saddle it up. Most of those are just general lead ropes and they're about 10 feet long. So I'm not really using it to train. I'm using it more to just bring the horse out, handle the horse, and I might tie the horse up in the stall with it. And that's what I'm, I'm kind of using those for. When I am taking the horse out to work the horse... Then I'm going to switch from that 10 foot poly lead. I'm going to go ahead and use one of the training ropes that I use, that I designed and and you can find with Weaver Leather. And the big difference there is that there's a difference in the length. So I have either a 15 foot or a 24 foot rope, but the length is not the bigger difference. The bigger difference is that this has a core. So this rope has a core. So when you hold onto the rope, if you play with it, you can kind of feel that there's that poly outside, which again is going to stay clean. It's not going to pick up the sawdust and the dirt and stuff like a cotton rope would. But the big difference is that this inside of this rope has a core and it doesn't let that tie in knots nearly as easily. And it's a very strong rope. It lasts in the sandy arenas. And what's interesting is when you read the description of what the core is, a lot of times it'll say like a marine rope or a yacht rope, which I always thought was kind of funny. But what I like the most about the rope, again, is it does not tend to tie in knots. And I'm going to post a picture on my website of a flat lunge line that has a lot of different knots in it. And this is a lunge line that I actually went to help somebody with their horse and I saw it hanging in their aisleway 
and I traded them one of my really nice training ropes for this knotted up old example of a flat web lunge line. And they are inexpensive, but they tie in knots. If you have any kind of material around your barn, like your lead rope, or let's say you have a stick and string, we'll talk about that in a minute, a little bit more, or your lunge line. If you find yourself using some kind of a tool like that, and it's constantly tying itself in knots, you should be aware that that's going to tangle up a lot easier and could potentially become wrapped around your hand, arm, leg, and that's a problem. So I like that my training rope has a core because these ropes with a core don't tend to get tangled up and tie in knots as easily. It's great that they're strong. Most of the time I'm not tying my horse up with it. It's great that it will last in the sand and the sweat. These are all great selling points, but I'm telling you the number one selling point is it does not get tangled up easily. Now, I tend to use the 24 foot length a lot more. My husband tends to use the 15 foot length a lot more. I think it's just a personal preference thing. If I were going to explain it, the 15 foot is great for kind of everyday use with a horse that's a little bit more trained. Maybe you're going to do some light lunging or you have a reason that you want the horse in a little bit closer to you. Maybe you're sending them over obstacles and reversing directions a lot and you don't want to have all that extra rope. And sometimes in trailer loading, because again, you're kind of in a little bit closer space. I use the 24 foot a lot more because I can do everything that I could do with the 15, but I can do more because I can send that horse out onto a bigger circle. It doesn't bother me that there's that extra loop or two that I would be handling. But again, this turns into purely personal preference at some point. Now, if you've got a horse that has less training, I want more distance between my body and that horse. So for sure, the 24 for I'm going to recommend for anybody. And then at that point, you're going to hope that you've been practicing with something because you got to be able to handle these tools to be effective with them. If you're in a situation that's more where you've got a horse that's more challenging. One of the things I want to cover before I get into training a little bit more is that, again, that stick and string. So if I'm going to go out and lunge the horse, I'm probably going to have a stick and string. Um, I could have a lunge lunge whip, but the biggest difference I see between the stick and string and the lunge whip is the string. So a stick and string, if you haven't seen that or not sure what I'm talking about, is going to be that it's going to the stick part that you handle is about four feet long. And then the string tends to be about four feet long or maybe a little bit longer than four feet. The whole strength of this tool is that if you have a nice weighted string, it's got enough weight that you can reach out there and you can kind of toss that string over the horse's back or their neck, or you can whip the ground and make a large, loud noise. And you can really control where that string lands because of the weight of the string. But if you buy an inexpensive one, what you have to be aware of is you have to make sure that that string is not something that does not have a core. Again, the core in the string is going to be key for it not tangling as easily and for having enough weight for you to be able to whip around and make the noise or be able to control where it goes when you want to toss it over the horse's back. So I do have lunge whips around here and I will use a lunge whip if I want to be able to reach out further than effectively eight feet. Because if the stick and string can reach four feet and then the whip, the the string part of it, the stick is four feet long and the string part's four feet long, I can reach out about eight feet. Well, I've got the length of my arm, so maybe I can reach 10 feet. But if I've got a horse that's 24 feet out there, then sometimes I will pick up a lunge whip, which they come in much longer lengths, But what you lose when you have the lunge whip is you lose some of that control because it is not a weighted string and it basically functions different. I'm going to talk more about the stick and string in a different episode. But the reason I wanted to talk about it a little bit here is it's got that very similar construction. If you have the one that's got a nice heavy core, so the one that I make with weaver leather has that nice heavy core in the string. And so the string behaves completely differently than the end of a lunge whip. 
And that's just an important thing to know. When someone is out using the halter and let's say you've got a rope halter on the horse and you go out and you're doing a training session on groundwork. The biggest thing that I see is that people will feel a little bit tangled up or encumbered by the equipment. And what I mean by that is if I set a tarp out there and I say, I want you to stand 10 feet away from the tarp and I want you to be able to send your horse over the tarp, reverse the horse, and then send the horse back over the tarp again. So basically, I want your horse going in this half moon shape, and I want you to keep reversing and reversing and reversing. You're going to have to practice with the tools to get good at this, because there's a lot going on. you got the horse moving around, you've got that stick in your hand, or a lunge whip, I'm going to say the stick and string. So you've got the stick and string in your hand, you're trying to figure out how to juggle that with when you're gonna with your timing as far as when you're gonna pull on the rope, when you might step back, when you might step forward. And it might seem like less is more. It might seem like having a flat web or something really lightweight is gonna be helpful because it feels like a little less bulk in your hand. But I'm going to encourage you to use these tools that you're gonna see across the board a lot of the trainers are using if you look at a lot of clinicians. And again, the reason is because it's got this good feel once you've developed the ability to use it. You're going to really enjoy the feeling of the signal that it gives to the horse. That weight that is there actually becomes a better way to communicate with the horse because the horse can feel a wave coming down through that line. If you've got that flat web lunge line, that it can flutter in the wind. It doesn't have the same signal. It doesn't have the same feel. So I understand there's the challenge, the physical challenge of using some of this equipment, but there's safety reasons for it, which again, that core will help it not tie up in knots. Could have used better words there probably, but it discourages it tying up in knots and it will in the long run benefit you if you're used to handling this rope because it will actually give you more signal, which is something we'll talk about more in the episode when I'm talking about bits and reins. As I wrap up the podcast, it's interesting because I think at the end of the day, if you think about the purpose of the halter and lead rope or lunge line or stick and string, the vast majority of it except for if you're tying your horse and walking away and basically you're looking at tying as saying, stay here. The most of the time we're handling the horses and we're training them, we're leading them, we're lunging them, we're communicating with them. And if you look at it from that aspect, so much of this is about having this equipment, being clear with how you use it, but also working to make it not very important. And what I mean by that is that if you're doing your groundwork training in a way that leads to the horse understanding to where the lead rope and halter and stick and string, they become irrelevant. Basically, you're working towards a horse that has an understanding and now the equipment becomes less of the focus. So for me, when the horses are first in training, a lot of times it's very much about clarity. And so I'm using a lot of times a rope halter for clarity of pressure, clarity of release, and different things like that. But later on in the training, it really doesn't matter to me if I'm going to go out there with an older horse that understands things like Willow. It doesn't really feel that different now, whether I lunge her in a rope halter or a nylon halter or a leather halter. Because at this point, she has enough training that the halter is not making that much of a difference. Her brain is fully engaged and she's there with me. This also explains some of the reason why I don't have some of the things in my barn that some of you might, and that's okay. So, for example, Trish mentioned breakaway halters. I don't have any breakaway halters, but I also can't remember the last time that a horse broke a halter or pulled back in a situation where they would be breaking a halter. And another example is, while we're on that subject, 
like a tie ring or any of those pullback type rings that people use. I know a customer brought a tie ring over and it's hanging on the wall out there, but we haven't used it. We don't typically use the tie rings. I've used them for the ability to understand what they're useful for. And I think if you have a horse that has an issue with pulling back and tying, uh, breaking things when they're tied, I think a tie ring or one of those cousins could be a very useful thing for you. But again, you've heard me talk about in the podcast, I believe in prevent, prevent, prevent. So a lot of prevention will actually make it so you don't have to use those things if you can prevent it from from going there. Now, I'll tell a short story about the tie rings, and that is that I actually went to a facility and they use tie rings with all the horses all the time. And if you're not familiar with the tie ring, basically there's different versions of them now, but on this one, you could adjust how much pull it had depending on how many times the rope was kind of wrapped through it. And they kept going to the softest wrap, so just one time through, which made the rope fairly easy to pull. Not incredibly easy, but I could pull it through. And so what happened was actually all the horses at this facility, and let's just say 20 horses, all 20 horses knew how to do what I call the pony drag. They all knew how to turn their head and get that angle with their neck and pull so that they could pull and reach something that they wanted to reach. That might be the brush bucket, that might be a blade of grass, but effectively because the tie rings had been used on a super loose setting with a horse that didn't have a problem, but also in a situation where the horse was basically allowed to pull and reach for things and get a reward because they did get to the thing, basically all these horses had learned how to pull because of the tie ring. This is not a flaw in the tie ring. This is a flaw in the use of the tie ring. And so you'll find other pullback devices. There are bungee cord things you can tie your horses up with. And I've heard horror stories about when those things break, which they can. There's all kinds of different things out there. But if you go back to what I said, which is if you're working towards getting the horse that understands more and more, at the end of the day, the equipment's going to matter a little less and less. Now, the one thing I really want to leave you with, you heard me mention it already. You heard Trish mention it. And I'm really not a fan of those flat web lunge lines. I will put a picture of one up on the website. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you can see it. But I really, really do not like them. I did not like them before. I'm going to tell you a story. I did not like them before this. And I really, really dislike them after this story. And the story I have to share with you is that years ago, I was at a horse expo and a husband and wife came up to the booth to talk to me. And the husband pushed the wife up to the booth in a wheelchair to meet me. And he spoke for her because her speech was impaired enough that they were more comfortable with him speaking. This was when the video with Roxy had been going around and he came up to say, my wife loves watching you ride. She was an avid rider and just wants me to tell you how much she's really enjoyed watching that ride with you and Roxy. And I, I was, I was, that's, thank you so much for telling me. And we talked a little bit more. And as we talked, the story came out that the reason she was in the wheelchair was because she had been lunging a horse. And I am not making this up. I have no reason to. She had been lunging a horse with one of those flat web halters, with, I mean, flat lunge lines. And I asked this after the fact because he didn't bring up the material. I brought it up later. She had been lunging the horse and the horse bolted. And when the horse bolted, the lunge line tightened up around her fingers and the horse began dragging her. So all four of her fingers had been basically caught in this noose of this flat lunge line when it tied when it when it tightened up and got tight and now the horse was dragging her around the arena which scared the horse 
which made it run faster around and around the arena. And she was dragged and smashed into the rails of the arena, into the posts that were in the ground. And she was permanently in a wheelchair. And she actually lost those four fingers. And it was just so devastating to meet somebody who'd had this happen. And I think you need to be careful with any equipment that you have. But again, if I can make one point, if you have a piece of equipment that is chronically tying itself in knots, it is trying to tell you something. It wants to tie itself in knots. It chokes down. It tightens up like that. It is a warning that that material is more likely to do what was done to this poor woman. And I just want to say that it is super important to know how to use your equipment, but it's so important to understand where your horse is coming from, to train all of that emotional control that we've talked about, to go through the trouble of teaching your horse how to respond under pressure so that, yes, it can turn and face. Yes, it will stop and look and try to understand, and it will give you the grace in that moment of emergency that the horse can be like, I think they're trying to communicate something to me. If you can give that gift to your horse, it's a gift that horse can give back to you. I am going to put links to all the products that we've talked about on my website. You'll be able to find links under a tab on my website called Stacy's Stuff, or if you find the podcast notes for this episode. Trish from Stagecoach West also created a discount code for listeners. So if you go over there and you're shopping at stagecoachwest.com, use the code STACY, my name, S-T-A-C-Y, for 15% off your entire order, excluding saddles. In next week's podcast, I'll be talking about bits and bridles. Thanks for joining me. If you enjoy listening to Stacy's podcast, please visit stacywestfall.com for articles, videos, and tips to help you and your horse succeed.